In this video, I'd like to get to the second part of Roland Barthes' Mythologies from 1957. And this is where things get really interesting in terms of the theory. So we'll try to sketch out some of the basics, and then in subsequent videos we'll flesh things out. At the beginning of the second part, Bart talks about how every kind of language or form of communication can become a myth, from a cave drawing to a ship's flag. Uh, the, the examples go on. And he's really trying to figure out how this movement from language or discourse to myth uh, ultimately works. So what we're dealing with here then is he's focused on semiotics, as we have discussed. Semiotics, which is the study of science. And he wants us to get to mythology. And by mythology, he just means that these signs take on an extra kind of meaning. Uh, they present a kind of worldview, a perspective on life. And this secondary meaning is, uh, according to Bart anyway, somewhat artificial because it's imposed on these uh, signs. Similarly then, we can say that we move from form, okay, the words are the forms, and we move to ideas. And Bart talks about how he studies ideas taking form, right? Taking the form of, of words and objects and so on. And all of this is really then the study of ideology. So this is a pretty classical kind of Marxist approach here. You're trying to study ideology, uh, in this case through myth and language, and you want to get back to history ultimately. Uh, how is history being shaped through language and through the ideas that we impose on it? And that's very Marxist ultimately because you're trying to get back to the economic aspect, right, the, the base uh, before we get to the superstructure. Okay, so we have a general sense of what Bart is doing here now. Uh, let's remind ourselves of the basic ideas of the sign, or the basic aspects. And as we said before, uh, we have a signifier when it comes to the sign. So a signifier, and that might be something like tree. So the word tree there we go, uh, conjures up an image or concept, and we call that the signified. The signified, there we are. And we'll just draw a very quick tree here because I'm sure this is familiar to you uh, from the previous videos. And in any case, if you studied Ferdinand de Saussure or linguistics, uh, you will know about these things as well. So all of this together, let's draw a big kind of egg-shaped thing here. <laughs> All of this together is the sign. There we are. And we can see this, this structure elsewhere as well. So if we turn, for instance, to Freud. Okay, so let's have a look at Freud. Uh, he talks about dreams. So if we think about a dream, then on the one hand, we have what he calls the manifest content. All right, so this would be what you remember in the morning. You wake up, you had a dream, and you kind of go, okay, well, I remember that I did this weird thing, or, you know, I was being chased through a maze of streets by a witch, or <laughs> who knows what. Uh, but then, what does it mean? And that deeper meaning, the stuff that's hidden, is what Freud calls the latent content. He argues that the interpreter of dreams really needs to get beyond the manifest content and try to understand the latent content, the hidden content. So the dream then is similar to the overall sign, uh, it has a similar structure, but as we'll see as we go on, there are major differences as well that Bart actually wants to point out here, uh, especially when it comes to myth. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about how in myth, we are dealing with a second kind of meaning that's imposed on the word. And Bart sketches this out somewhat. Uh, so again, we're gonna have a bit of overlap with what we talked about. Uh, let's say that we have sign one. Okay, sign one. And of course, as we said before, we have the signified. I'm just gonna shorten this. And we have, the, well actually I should write it out because it's gonna be confusing otherwise. And we have the signifier. There we go. And all of this, put it in a box. There we go, this is sign one. Now, what he's saying is that what happens in myth, okay, is that all of this sign one, I'll just use a different color here to make it uh, clear, all of this sign one 
becomes the new signifier. There we go, the new signifier. And this signified has a new a signifier has a new signified attached to it. There we go. And we call all of this together sign two. There we are. Let's look at an example here. Uh, so if we take our example of the tree, which we have before, right? So here's our tree. Now all of this together becomes our new signifier. And then what is our new signified? Well, it could be that the tree is a symbol. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about the word symbol because that's not quite the right word. Uh, that it's some kind of sign that, that suggests temptation here. Temptation, uh, maybe organic life. There we are. And the list goes on. Any kind of signifier can mean a whole host of different things, right? We add this meaning to it. So what has happened here uh, is that this first level sign has taken on a new meaning. It has become a signifier to a new signified, and that is our second sign. That's This is the myth that we're dealing with. So what Bart argues then is that um, when it comes to myth, we are dealing with what he calls a second-order semiological system, right? That's, that's this part. We've added this to the first part, the basic sign. He also calls this a meta-language, so it's about another language. It interprets another language. Uh, conversely, he calls the first sign, he calls this an, a language object. It's the object that can be used for new purposes. Let's look at a couple more examples here. Uh, so he talks about how in grammar school back in the day, uh, people learning Latin, they would come across this, this sentence, quia ego nomino leo, and uh, this basically just means because I'm called a lion. But this is not really a sentence that teaches you anything about lions, right? If this is sign one, uh, you would think, okay, this is about lions and somebody being called a lion or the lion being called a lion. But in the second level of meaning, it's really just a sentence that's used to show uh, grammar. For instance, does the, the verb match up with the pronoun, right, with the subject? And even more importantly, how do the pronoun and the noun, right, ego and, and leo, how do they relate? Are they in the same uh, form, you, you might say? Okay, I'm not going to get into Latin here too much, but I think you can see that what he's trying to say is that the example of the lion tells you nothing about lions. It tells you everything about grammar. And that's how we move from sign one to sign two. Another example is of a soldier, let's say a black soldier, giving a salute to the flag. And I've just changed the flag here from the French one to the American one, uh, but it's really the same idea. On the level of sign one, this is simply somebody giving a salute, right? On the level of sign two, this tells you everything about the empire, about uh, the military, about patriotism, um, all of these kinds of things. So that's how every time we move from sign one, which then turns into sign two. Coming back to our diagrams here, Bart assigns three different words to his diagram to explain uh, what each part now is. So the first part here is the form, okay? So sign one, we can say sign one becomes the form in which we stick the content of sign two, you might say. Uh, and you can also say that the signifier here is the form as well, because ultimately all of sign one becomes the signifier. So that's the form. Think of it a little bit as uh, maybe a vase. Okay, so you have a nice vase. Well, probably nicer than this one. And you can stick all kinds of stuff in it. You could stick a flower in it if you wanted to. There we go. Give it a couple of leaves. Uh, but we could stick other stuff in there. We could stick a pen in it if we wanted to. There we go. Um, and the idea here is that the form becomes kind of transparent, doesn't it? Right? Like we, we look at this and we, we don't even really notice anymore that this is a container. Uh, and in the same way, the grammatical sentence becomes the container for a grammatical lesson. Uh, the, the black person saluting becomes the container, the vase, in which we stick a different meaning. 
and so on and so forth. So that's, that's really the first idea here is that we have the form with which we are using. And we empty out its historical meaning, right? The lion, the soldier's history, all of that kind of stuff. And then we stick in something new. Now, I mentioned the word symbol before, and I just want to come back to that because the form here is, is not a symbol. Okay, so not a symbol. There we are. And the reason for that is because uh, the, the, the black um, soldier, let's say, or even the, the sentence about the lion, there's too much reality there, too much presence, too much history. We're not just talking about some abstract rose symbolizing something else or a heart symbolizing love. Uh, we're talking about real history, and we shouldn't forget that, especially uh, because this is a Marxist analysis, right? History is real and granular, and we need to appreciate that. Okay, so not quite a symbol then, uh, and we've called this first part the sign. The other parts of the language here are that sign, uh, sign two here, the signified, can now be called the concept. So this Bartz calls the concept from now on. It's the signified in the myth. Um, and if you think about part one, for instance, we talk about wrestling, right? What does wrestling mean as a concept? Well, it means spectacle. That would be an example. And then finally, all of sign two, so the, the whole thing here, uh, is what he calls the signification, the signification. So far, then, we've talked about the form, but let's zoom in a little bit more to the concept and the signification. And one of the interesting words that uh, he uses to talk about the concept is the word condensation. So condensation, which if you know some Freud, you would probably recognize this word because Freud talks a lot about how condensation happens in, in dreams and elsewhere. Uh, and think, for instance, of, let's say, a window. So you get up in the morning, right? There's condensation on the window, drops of water. And what you see there is how, how the moisture in the air has become condensed, you might say, on the window pane. And in the same way, if you're dreaming, then often what happens is that some little detail right, is what you remember. It's like that little drop of water, but there's a reason for that little detail in your dream. It's a condensed version of all kinds of other stuff in the background, uh, the latent meaning, right, the traumas that you're dealing with and so on. So condensation then is, is a really fascinating idea here because for Bart, the concept that we have here is really just a brief condensation of a much bigger picture. So we might say that the signified, right, has behind it all of this other stuff, this whole ideology of, or way of looking at things. Uh, and he says often it's very difficult to capture what that concept is. In fact, we often have to make up words to be able to describe this, this concept. So let me give you a couple of examples here. Um, if you take the word hipster, for instance, right, hipster, there we go, it's a great word. Well, what is a hipster? You could, you could write paragraphs and essays trying to define what a hipster is, but intuitively you kind of grasp that this concept is something, right? It's something out there. Uh, but if we really wanted to fill it in, we would need all of this background information. And that's where we see the condensation of the concept, which is a really fascinating idea. Uh, maybe one more example here. If we talk about Oxbridge, which is a combination of Oxford and Cambridge, uh, then again, we are dealing with this kind of made up concept that allows us to make sense of a certain culture, certain uh, perspective on life. And both of these are then called neologisms, which are just words that are coined to um, to kind of register something. And I think I'm missing an S here, neologisms, there you go. <laughs> At this point then, uh, we can move on finally to the signification. We've talked about the form, the concept, and now the signification. There's this great uh, sentence in the book where Bart writes, however paradoxical it may seem, myth hides nothing. Its function is to distort, not to make disappear. 
What you see here is that Bart is now thinking about the whole signification, the whole sign, and its purpose. And he's saying, myth is not about hiding stuff. It's about making things clear, right? Like the, the black person saluting the flag. That's meant to really point you to patriotism. It's sending a message. And you can see ideology at work here. Well, there's a few things we can say about this. First of all, uh, this is different from Freud, as we saw before. So with Freud, the latent content is hidden, and the manifest content is what you remember in the morning. So there, things are hidden, and there's a reason for that. It's often because these things that are hidden are too traumatic for us to face, right? And we kind of want to hide them from our perspective. Um, he does agree with Freud, however, that there is distortion in the myth. So what tends to happen is that if we think back to our signified right, and our signifier, we constantly go back and forth between these two things. Um, the form and the concept keep being interchanged and so on. Sometimes we think about the soldier, sometimes about the empire, <laughs> and we just keep going back and forth between them. And we also recognize that there's some deformation there. The soldier does not naturally represent these things, but we're using the soldier for this particular purpose. Coming back to our quotation and the idea that myth hides nothing, another thing we can say about this is that it doesn't always match what Bart says elsewhere. So when he talks about Operation Margarine, as you might remember, he suggested that there's an element of deception there. We are given all the bad features of margarine in order to prepare us to accept margarine overall, nevertheless, as a great thing. So you might say then that the faults of margarine are openly confessed, right? That part is honest, but the strategy is hidden. In other words, does myth hide nothing? Not necessarily. And finally, we'll finish here with a reference to another thinker. If you read the, the thought of Slavoj Žižek, who is a philosopher, his view of myth, I think, is somewhat different because he often argues that myth is all about hiding things. And the classic example here is the concept of the Jew. So what happens with scapegoating the Jew, right, is that we do that, well, hopefully we don't do that, but some people do, in order to hide our hidden trauma. We want to have this notion of a whole organic society without blemishes, uh, and we struggle with our own lack of wholeness. And so what do we do? Well, we create the Jew as a scapegoat. We put the Jew outside of our community and say, this person is other and different. And why do we do it? It's because we actually are more interested in ourselves and in creating a certain image of ourselves and overcoming our traumas. What you see there is that we've created one sign, the Jew, in order to hide from ourselves the actual meaning, right? The actual trauma that we're dealing with here. Okay, so that allows you then to have a basic sense of uh, Bart's categories and his concepts. And hopefully it also uh, provides some opportunities to reflect on them and start critiquing them.